Good. Very, very good. <clears throat> very good. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Can I encourage you? Uh, we are in the Christmas season, and uh, so after the service, there's some homemade treats made, so don't rush off without getting your a bit of homemade um, Rocky Road, I believe it is, which will be really, really lovely. Really lovely. Is everyone good? Yeah. Ready to get in the Word of God? Yeah. Got your Bibles with you? Yeah. Turn with me, if you can, to Matthew 1. Matthew 1. It'll be on the screen as well. The Christmas season, December. All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can gather together. Lord, we ask that this morning you speak to us through your word, that not only do we hear it, but it changes something in us and starts to refine us and make us more like you. Lord, we don't just come here to socialize, we come here to glorify you, to honor you, to learn more about you, to grow closer to you. So, Lord, I ask to partner my brokenness and my frailty with your sovereignty that you would speak through me, Lord, that we would all hear you. Holy Spirit, flood this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Matthew 1, verse 18. Verse 18. I'm going to read a little bit of scripture here, a bit of um, Christmas scripture. Love it. It's very cool. So, so important. Matthew 1, verse 18. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and didn't want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you're to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he didn't have relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. If we keep reading Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of, of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then, Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Christmas. What a wonderful season. Point number one, light is good. Light is good. I don't know about you and your family, but in my family, we have some family traditions. And they come out, especially in December, Christmas time. There's lots of family traditions. Our Christmas traditions are putting up the Christmas tree. Who has their Christmas tree up already? Who's had it up for like months? (laughs) Some of you would have, right? We've got our Christmas tree up. We put the tree up as a family. We, We do it together. The kids take turns each year putting the star on the top. It's like a a prized, a prestigious thing to put the star on top of the Christmas tree. It's an honoured role. Uh, My wife is incredible at Christmas. If it was just me, we might just have one little piece of tinsel and that'd be about it. But she like goes the whole hog. She decorates everything. The kids have an advent calendar that she's made and she puts um, new tasks in there every day, things for them to do, whether that be like uh, make a card or something like that. The kids read these notes, they, they read a little Bible verse, they cook some cookies or they make something, all of that kind of stuff. It's really good, really, really good. It's fun. Another activity that my kids seem to like to do is to hang Christmas lights in the house. Is anyone here one of those Christmas light people? Covered in house, covered in Christmas lights. So in our house, the outside isn't covered, but there's lights in the lounge room. There's lights around the tree. There's lights across all the bookshelves. There's lights in the kitchen. There's lights in the bedrooms. In fact, last night at about 10 o'clock, I could hear this noise, something going on. And I went to check what the noise was. And it was coming out of my son's bedroom. And there he was (laughs) hanging Christmas lights in his room. Like he looked like shocked. It was like... (gasps) I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's 10 o'clock. And he goes, putting Christmas lights up, Dad. What else would I be doing at 10 o'clock? It's like, great. Thanks for putting that sticky tape on the painted walls, son. I love it. But there's lights everywhere. Lights, lights, lights all over the house. We even go to look at Christmas lights. Does anybody else do that? Family outing to go and check out other people's Christmas lights. <laughs> it's really good. The houses that spend... It's amazing, isn't it? Um, the amount of money and time that these people spend to illuminate their houses. Uh, we went to visit some friends for dinner the other night and their next door neighbour, they had some lights that looked really pretty, a nice sort of reasonable amount. And next door, uh, the house next door to them, the lights weren't on yet because the guy hasn't finished preparing it all, but lights all over the place. And every year his front lawn dies... Right, because he's got Christmas lights all over the front lawn and can't put the sprinklers on and then he rejuvenates it again so the next year he can do it again. Incredible. Lights everywhere, covering entire houses. We will do at least one or two family outings to have a look at Christmas lights every year. Every time, every year, without fail, we go and look at lights. And some of these houses are next level. There's a street in Rockingham, we used to live down in Rockingham and we go to this same street all the time, the whole street they're like competing and you can see the neighbours, they walk out, the dad's on the front lawn looking over like, hmm, another one huh, All right, I'll get you and you can tell he's thinking about going to Bunnings to buy more lights. (laughs) So where does this idea come from? Where does this concept come from? Well, cast your minds back to Christmas Eve 1841, 1841, at Windsor Castle in England, Queen Victoria's German-born husband, Alfred, decided to do something special that hadn't been done before. So he got a tree and he got all these beautiful ornaments made, these, these dainty little decorative things, and he hung them on this tree And he wanted to display them, display the tree so everybody can see it with these beautiful ornaments on it. But he realized that you couldn't see them all. They were just too hard to see within the tree. So he decided to get dozens of white candles. 
and stick them to the tree with wax and light them so that it would illuminate the tree. Lit it up. I can see lots of issues with that. But this tradition spread throughout England and then, like many things, spread across the pond, hit America, and America went nuts. So President Franklin Pierce set up a Christmas tree, the first Christmas tree in the White House, the records tell us, in 1856. And as we know, it's now a Christmas tradition everywhere to set up a tree. Now, there might be another history, but I thought that was quite fascinating. Can you imagine how many fires there must have been over the years? Here's your Christmas presents, kids. Oh, no. Trees. Because you imagine, like, because I've always thought about that, you know, that people like the real Christmas tree, but usually they're those pine needly things, right? Doesn't that just become really messy? Don't they die? And, like, it just, I don't, yeah. Plastic one works for me. So over time they dry and they set fire. Interesting. But today... We're grateful that we don't have to use candles, right? I'm grateful that we don't have to use candles. We're grateful for Thomas Edison because he's the reason that we don't have to use candles. We're grateful that in 1880, he invented the light bulb. I'm also grateful for his mate and business partner, Edward Hibbert Johnson. Everyone knows who he is, right? <laughs> It's one of those funny names. So in 1882, Edward applied the technology that his mate Thomas Edison had come, come up with to the Christmas tree. He had a house in New York and the front window of the house uh, was by the sidewalk and it was a busy street and lots of people would walk past. So he followed this tradition and put a Christmas tree on there but rather than candles... He strung hand-wired like 80 lights in series in red, white and blue little covers on them, right? So very patriotic. And he wrapped it around the Christmas tree. He then went the next step too and he built a little, um, I was going to say rotisserie, but it's not a rotisserie, but a little turntable to turn the tree. So you, you can see this thing, right? It's a tree with these lights. Nobody's seen them before. It's this brand new thing and it's in the front bay window of this house in New York and it's spinning around. It gathered attention. People came from all over the place to stand and watch this tree spin around with these electric light bulbs on it. Beautiful. Amazing. People were stunned by it. Large crowds came to stand at the window. As time went by, he added more light bulbs into the series. But these guys were clever, very clever. They saw potential. They saw an opportunity. So they started selling strings of light bulbs for people's Christmas trees. And they sold each string of lights for $12. Yeah, huh, 12 bucks. It's quite reasonable. Hang on. Cast your mind back. The penny was different then. In today's value, it would be over $500 for a string of lights. Incredible, incredible. Christmas is a season of light, season of light. And people are still spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars on strings of light. It's amazing. It's fascinating. But it's also fascinating when we realise why it's so important. Here in Australia, we're in the southern hemisphere. So Christmas comes in summertime. Hot, long days, short, hot nights. But where Jesus was born, in Bethlehem, it's in the northern hemisphere. And it was winter, short days, long nights. Very different to what we see. There's a little description picture for you so when you do the study it tells us that in december around about the 22nd 23rd of december is the solstice right which is the shortest day in the northern hemisphere we have a long day and a short night they have the shortest day so it is physically a dark time a very dark time the sun rises late and sets early. 
Add to that, they were under uh, the oppressive rule of the Romans. Um, and in Isaiah, it talks, the prophet talks about this, actually. It's really, really um, good. How much time has I got? I've got time. I might read this quickly. In Isaiah, the end of chapter 8 and the start of chapter 9, it kind of gives us a little bit of a picture here um, of how the world kind of was. It says, when, mel- when men tell you to consult mediums and spiritualists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to his word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they'll become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Nevertheless, there'll be no more gloom for those who were in distress. There'll be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there'll be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. It's talking about how they were living in darkness, but then as Jesus comes, he's the light and releases them into blessing for those who follow. So where they were, it was literally and spiritually dark. But then God, sovereign and loving, sends light into the world. He told us he was going to do it. Genesis 1, 3 to 4. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated light from darkness. Amazing. Amazing. God puts a bright light in the sky. We read the story like it's just a story that we learn in kids' church. But it's an account of what took place. God put a bright light in the sky for these magi, these kings to follow. The magi, it comes from a Greek word, magos, meaning one of learned and priestly class. So intelligent people who are studying things. And then it says that they brought gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And I imagine that would have really helped Jesus' family, set him up quite well to be able to do what he was called to do. God had already planned all of this. Those same magi, those kings, those learned fellow, those priestly people then become like the first evangelists and messengers as they go out sharing the good news that the Son of God had been born, the Messiah had been born. Incredible. Incredible. We hear the story so much but do we allow it to sink in? Son of God. Son of God. Point number two. Say point number two. Hope is good. Hope is good. I believe that the Christmas season is a reminder to us all. Not a reminder of presents. Not a reminder of 
lobster and other overdone foods. Not a reminder of the pressure of having to clean the house so everybody can come over and be part of a celebration. But the Christmas season is a reminder of the birth of Jesus. And the birth of Jesus is a reminder of hope. It's a reminder of hope. Jesus is the hope of the world. We see this when God speaks to shepherds at the same time that Jesus is being born. In Luke 2, verse 8 to 14, it says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. It's cold, it's dark, they're out in the fields to look after their sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the... Sorry, I'm going to stop for a sec. Can I picture what's going on here? Imagine yourself out in a field with sheep in the dark and in the cold, right? They're out in the dark, they're in the cold, they're there, not expecting anything to happen. Then suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. (laughs) You would be, right? You'd be like, what? But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news. That will bring great joy to all people. The Saviour, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognise him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Imagine, imagine being there. Imagine the angel of the Lord, heavenly armies standing with you, around you, the glory, the light shining, giving glory to God. Jesus is the hope of the world. His birth, his death and his resurrection changed history. It changed the world. It impacted eternity for you and for me. We can't even fathom that. It's so mind-boggling that this one man changed everything. This one baby changed absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. Say point number three. Point number three. Wonder is good. Wonder is good. If the musicians would like to come and join me, that would be great. I've been thinking about Christmas and about the story uh, of Jesus' birth and about how we um, process it, or look at it, or talk about it, or describe it. Even when we talk about God, we talk about God so, just casually, just so casually about God. We need to learn to be in awe of God. In absolute awe and wonder of God. He is incredible. To be amazed again and again at what he has done for us and what he is doing for us. We've become so familiar with this season. So familiar with the story that we no longer really sit in wonder. It's another Christmas season, another Christmas message. That pastor's going to talk about a baby in a manger. Oh, yeah, it's a miracle. We've just become familiar with it. This Christmas season, can I encourage you? No, can I challenge you to be in wonder of God? To be in awe of God? To seek 
him again. Because this is not just some fairy tale spoken to kids so they sleep. This is the story of Jesus Christ. This is powerful stuff. We need to be amazed and in wonder and in awe time and time again. Every time we read it, it should invigorate our soul. It should do something on the inside. It should churn your spirit. It should excite you. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to earth for you and for me. It should do something in you. The Son of God, the Messiah, born to a virgin mother. That's a miracle. We're just like, oh, yeah, Virgin Mary. No, 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 no. It's a miracle. An angel tells her what will happen. Uh, that's a miracle. Another miracle. It's not just like every day you're bumping into an angel. Hey, how are you going? Go and do this. It's a miracle. Miracle after miracle. Then an angel talks to Joseph about it. That's a miracle. Again, another miracle. Prophets prophesy the event hundreds of years earlier. That's a miracle. Word for word, they prophesy what's going to be. And it comes to pass. It's a miracle. An absolute miracle. The most powerful being in all creation chose to manifest himself in the most fragile being, a baby. The most powerful being chose to come as a baby. That needed to be cared for, to be wrapped to be nurtured, to be protected. God himself chose to do that for you, for me. This season, be in wonder, be in awe of God. Because that's what this season is about. That God chose to come so we could have relationship with him. So he could pull us in. He came on the darkest night, in the darkest season, to shine the brightest light. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening in your life, if it feels like it is the darkest season, well, he's about to shine the brightest light because that's what God does because God is good. Light is good. Hope is good. Wonder is good. Can we learn to live in wonder again? Can this season, this Christmas be different for you? As we start December, this first weekend, can we make a decision now that this Christmas is different? That it's not the same as last year? It's not overly familiar where we just go another story, another nursery rhyme another whatever but we live in wonder of a holy and sovereign God holy and sovereign righteous faithful who sacrificed it all so that sinners like you and I can be restored to perfect relationship with him so that we no longer needed to wait for the prophet to come to hear from God, but could hear from God ourselves. No longer needed to petition the priest to get a word in season, but can come to the Father and be counseled directly. Oh, man, that is awesome. That is mind blowing. That is awe-inspiring. That should put us in a constant state of wonder. Light, hope, and wonder. And they equal joy and salvation. He came to set you free. To give you more than you could ever imagine in your life. To give you a stronger relationship than you could possibly dream of when we position ourselves at the foot of the Father 
in his loving arms, nothing is impossible. May this Christmas season be different to every other Christmas season you've ever experienced. May this Christmas season be filled with so much revelation and transformation in your spirit that you're a new person out the other side. My heart's prayer is that our Advent calendars this season lead us closer and closer and closer to God. Not to a new pair of shoes, although I'm happy to receive new shoes, but closer to God. (laughs) Sovereign. Sovereign God. Loving Father. Let's close our eyes. Heavenly Father. You're amazing, Lord. You are amazing. Your goodness and your mercy knows no bounds. Your love for each and every one of us, your heart, your care, it's amazing. Lord, we don't want this Christmas season to be the same as any other, Lord. Lord, we want to be transformed Lord impact us in an unbelievable way this Christmas season reveal to us afresh your goodness Lord give us a desire to be in your word and reading through this historical document document of what took place Lord and may we receive Revelation as we read it. Holy Spirit inspired revelation, Lord. May the words jump off the page. Lord, right now I want to pray, Lord, for those who maybe struggle to read their Bible, Lord. May there be a change in that, Lord. May you give them a supernatural desire to be in the Word. Clarity, discernment, revelation. May it May it leap off the page. As they read, Lord, may they they smell it. May they feel it. May they sense what's going on as they describe your many testimonies. Lord, for those who have been praying for a miracle, may the many miracles laid out just in the story of Jesus' birth, may they be an inspiring push for each of us to be looking out for the amazing things that you're doing in our lives every day. Lord, draw each person close. May this Christmas season be all about you. Lord, help me to fix my attention on you. Not on everything else, not the wind and the waves, not the presents, not the food not the decorations, but on you, sovereign God. May this year be different. May this year be different. Thank you, Jesus. With everybody's eyes closed and nobody looking around, if you've uh, never made a decision to put Jesus on the throne of your life, then I want to give you an opportunity to do that. But also, if maybe you have made a decision before, but you maybe have slipped away a little bit, not been as attentive, not been as focused, not been as determined to be in relationship with God, then I want to give you an opportunity to change that today. There is no better moment than right now to make a decision for Jesus. Son of God, born a baby, to bear our sins so we can have relationship with God, dies on a cross and raised again to the right hand of the Father to secure eternal life for us. So if you're in 
any one of those two categories, with everybody's eyes closed and no one looking around, I'm just going to ask you just to slip up your hand so I know who I'm praying for. I'm not going to call you out the front. I just want to be able to pray for you from here. If you know you need to make a decision for Jesus, yeah, well done. Both, Yeah, I see those two hands. Amazing. Best decision you could ever make. Is there anyone else? Yes. Well done. Down the front there. Good. Thank you, Lord. Just a couple more moments. Is there anyone else? Just know that he's calling you. Calling you into relationship. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Yeah, well done. Well done. Precious God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I'm just going to ask everybody to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I need you. I need you in my life. I need you in control of my life. Thank you for sending your son to take my sin so I could have a relationship with you. From this moment forward, I promise to honor you, to follow you, and to glorify you for all my days. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a clap of praise? So good. So good. Best decision you could ever make. For those of you who did put your hand up, um, one of our team will will just come and give you a bit of a nudge and say hello. So don't be freaked out if they come up to you. Just just want to uh, put a Bible in your hand or encourage you and see how we can help you as a church to keep that journey going. Because when we make a decision for Christ, it's not a just a one moment where and it's done. It's actually a decision from here. Let's change something. Let's do something. Let's move closer. Let's be determined to draw into to God, to be wowed by Him, to be loved by Him, to be transformed by Him. Amen. Christmas season is here. There is Rocky Road. What are we going out on? Light up. Praise. Let's do it. Let's stand to our feet and praise God, shall we?